welcome aboard. And um, the presentation I'm going to give this evening is one that I wish I'd given a long time ago because it feels like I've had this knowledge for a while because I've been teaching art appreciation with this particular approach for years and years and years. For 10 years, 10, 10 years. So preparing this presentation has given me, given me an opportunity to kind of go back and look back at the courses that I've taught, talk to former colleagues that also taught art appreciation and that I, I worked with, um, with using this approach, and also especially and most valuable I've found for myself and for understanding the value of art appreciation, talking to former students. So I'm going to incorporate a lot of that in, um, in, in this presentation. And the former students that have been, that are adults now and that are articulate and thoughtful and can look back on their education and, and see what was meaningful and what was valuable. All right, Liz, I'm glad you invited yourself. Excellent. Okay, great. So, first off, I want to talk a little bit about what comes to mind with art appreciation and why people do art appreciation. Because I think what you're going to see with my approach is going to be a little bit different. Those of you familiar with touching the art, you, you understand this. But I want to set out what people commonly think of as art appreciation. And I, I did a little bit of research. I talked to a lot of parents. I, I went to Facebook groups and, and engaged parents in why they saw as art appreciation as valuable. And I saw some common answers. And maybe you can think of off the top of your head what you think is a value of art appreciation in, in a child's curriculum and education. And if you think of something off the top of your head, go ahead and put it in the chat um, and see if it matches up with what I've got. So a couple of things that I learned. First of all, it is a creative outlet. And the first thing that people think of when they think of art appreciation, they think of painting or drawing or making a collage or sculpting something. When I took an art appreciation class in high school, the thing that I remember doing is making a kind of mug uh, out of clay. When I tell people I'm an art appreciation teacher, the follow-up question is, oh, so you're an artist. And I have to kind of sheepishly say, I, I, no, I'm actually, I'm, I'm not, and I'm pretty unskilled in the art of art. So that's something that people typically think of, and they think of art as something that you can go to that isn't science, that isn't math, that allows you to be more creative, to do something hands-on, get the kids involved in doing something, and to be expressive. Right? That sounds familiar. Now, another reason why art appreciation seems to be studied is, and this is kind of a follow-up to a creative outlet, and this is a, a maybe a deeper reason. It's, I saw this a lot, it form, forms pathways in the right side of the brain. Now, I'm not, um, I, I'm not a, a cognitive psychologist and I don't know much about um, the function of brain, but this is something, this is, I think, have you, you guys know a little bit about the right side, right brain, left brain dichotomy, how your left brain is your analytical side, logical, um, is detail oriented, the right side of your brain is the more imaginative side, um, associative, creative side, and a lot what a lot of um, educators think is school and education focuses on your left side of the brain at the neglect of your right side of the brain. And so in order to have a fulfilling life, you need to, be, you need to develop your right side of the brain too to be creative. And it improves problem solving skills and, um, and thoughtfulness and things like that. But the right side of the brain, you need to form pathways, and the way you do that is by doing art appreciation primarily 
as some kind of creative endeavor that you take on. And that's that would be the I think the the main reason. Now, what I found from a lot of homeschool parents is they see that public schools don't focus a lot on art, and maybe their child is more inclined towards the arts. So they make it a bigger point to nurture students, their child, who enjoys the arts. There are opportunities in, in public schools, and they have an artsy kid. Their kid may not be science-oriented, math and science-oriented, maybe more art-oriented, and so they want to nurture that. They want to foster that development, and that would be a reason for doing art appreciation. So that implies that there are, that there are, there are two kinds, often two kinds of students. And that's, that's kind of common in the culture, right, to see this person is going to be an accountant and this person is going to write plays. So you see that dichotomy, and because public schools don't focus on the creative people, you need to have art appreciation outside of that to foster that. And then there's one more element of art appreciation that I found and uh, very common. And that is as an integration with, into other subjects. So often this is the case, for example, with history. Um, you study a time period, and then you look at some artworks from that time period. Or um, something I do with literature, you, you read the Greek myths, and then you look at paintings that depict those Greek myths. So things like that. And that's something that's common. And art is seen as a kind of uh, enhancer of other subjects in the curriculum. Okay, so that's that's what's out there as to the value, the reasons, and the approaches to art appreciation. So I think I can boil it down to two main things of what people consider art appreciation. And I, I got three here, but I'll show you why. The first one is art creation. The second one is art history. And maybe you as an adult will think of this a little bit more. Um, if you take an art appreciation class, you're expecting to get some art history and also to look at styles. And maybe if you're not going to do any drawing or anything yourself, you, you'll just focus on the vocabulary styles, colors, textures, different lines, and you'll look at Van Gogh's coloration versus Picasso's colors and his blue period or things like that. So art history, art creation, those seem to be the two main ways in which art appreciation is taught at any level. And sometimes when you, you, you combine the two. Now, I think there's something else. And part of the presentation is I'm going to describe a little bit of what that other kind of art appreciation is. But before I get into that, I want to step back and look at the value of art and why art at all should be taught. Because It is seen as something secondary by most of the culture. I want to show you a quick um, uh, little statement I found from the Common Core website. I, I don't know. Are you guys familiar with Common Core at all? So this is the uh, the, the national um, set of standards for public schools. And here I'm going to talk about art as, in the broad sense, the art. So literature as the main kind of art, the conceptual art, the written word, which is the easiest to get into. So here is a quote describing the value of reading a novel. Focusing on extended texts will enable students to develop stamina and persistence they need to read and extract knowledge and insight 
from the larger volumes of material. Not only do students need to be able to read closely, but they also need to be able to read larger volumes of text when necessary for other purposes. And this is indicative of the approach that Common Core is taking towards English classes, where they've diminished the amount of literature, poetry, and novels, which is the main way that art gets taught. And the reason they're doing that is because any kind of writing suits the purpose, whether it's a manual for how to make a computer or um, the, the, the Uh, the the text uh, underneath the uh, I don't know I'm trying to think of something to name the the text uh, and the car door when you open the car and you have a little warning sign and you've got to be able to read that extract proper information and summarize so that's the way that art is is kind of viewed it's something secondary and a lot of homeschool parents are reacting against that. Now, I want to make a quick defense of art as a whole and why it's important. And this is not the main point I'm going to make, but I think it's important to, to see the deeper value of art and how, why it's important in uh, a child's education. And I'm going to approach it from the perspective of the art as a whole, which is going to include literature uh, as well as the visual arts. And one of the points... I'm going to make throughout is that literature and the visual arts are going to be intertwined. Um, now, one reason I'm not going to focus too much on this is because I think there are others who do a better job at presenting the value of literature and the arts in education. And I want to refer you to Lisa Van Dam. Um, she is uh, a brilliant literature teacher and has written a lot on the value of literature. And she has a blog, lisavandam.com, and um, you can check that out to get uh, a lot of great ideas on, the, on how important literature is in a child's um, conceptual development, in a child's, uh, in a child's education. Okay. Uh, let's see, I see a, a hand raised, Yoon and Scott. Okay, no problem. No problem. And as I'm going through, and if you, um, if you do have a, a question or a thought that you want to bring up, please do raise your hand. Um, and please use the chat as much as you like and as possible because I, I enjoy seeing the, uh, the interaction. Um, now, typically for a class, what I'd have is everybody would be unmuted and you could interact and maybe even get on video. But because we've got a short period of time and we're going to we have a lot of people on board, I want to keep it going. But please interact with me through the chat. So I'm, I like seeing, even though if I, I don't get to read, I like seeing the feedback. And then if there's some point that you really want me to address, raise your hand. Okay. So just very quickly, the value of studying art. A few key points. One, there's no frigate like a book. Uh, and this comes from an Emily Dickinson poem that I like. There's no frigate like a book to take you lands away. You get to go live the lives of all kinds of different people, whether it's a hunchback in medieval Paris or uh, a traveling mariner escaping monsters in ancient Greece or a young girl coming to live in a new home in uh, England after her parents died. You get to live these lives. You get to go to these places. You get exposed to the vast panoply of humankind and human potential. Next. Art is purposeful. And this is a phrase seeing the intention of details that uh, one of my former students um, mentioned to me when I talked to him. Uh, and I love that phrase because it kind of go, it kind of makes it sound like it's attention to detail, but much more important than attention to detail is intention of detail. Everything in an artwork is purposeful. 
and developing a mindset to look at your life, the world, the people around you, with the thought that there's meaning behind things. That you can, it's not just a bunch of chaotic flux that you can't make sense of, oh, who knows. It's not that attitude. When you read good novels, when you look at great art, you become uh, someone who has a habit of looking for meaning, the intention and details. Okay, next. A vision of what is possible in life. And so this kind of goes along with a note frigate like a book. And um, it, it gives you images of people that you can aspire to. It gives you images of characters that you um, you don't want to be like. And it gives you scenes of moments that you can have in your life. And then one final thing. Experiencing art leaves you with a memento. After you go through a novel, you carry the characters with you. Despite, um, I, I love to kill Mockingbird, and um, uh, and Atticus Finch is one of my favorite characters. And I always consult Atticus Finch if uh, there's something that I'm confused about or want to do, and or or I get angry with somebody, I, say, I, I ask him, okay, so Atticus, what would you do in this situation? And there's a, a line from a poem that I like, uh, keep a poem in your pocket and a picture in your head. Keep a poem in your pocket, kind of take away something with you that you're from literature that you're always going to have around, and a picture in your head, at, an image, and I like that combination because a poem is the conceptual, the words, and an image can immediately come to mind as a vision of something, and art is distinctive in that way because you can have that immediate image, and that often is very powerful. Okay, so that's my defense of art as such and why I think it's important as a whole. Now, Going back to that other kind of art appreciation. Now, the other kind of art appreciation I'm talking about is going to be called reading an artwork. And actually, I, I don't want to show you this yet. Let me go back to the blank screen because I want to tell you a quick little story. You guys ready for a quick little story? So, this past summer I went on a road trip and I got to see all kinds of friends I hadn't seen in a long time. And um, a couple of those friends, uh, uh, a couple, uh, who just recently had a child. I hadn't met the child before and a wonderful little girl, um, not quite two years old. Um, I, I got this meet her and visit with her and participate in story time right before bedtime with her. And I found something really odd about story time that my friend was doing. He had a beautiful picture book with, you know, the words of the story. And he started reading the book. And you know what? He, he wasn't reading the words. He was reading... He was looking at the images and describing the images. And I, I thought that was interesting, um, but I, I didn't say anything about it. And then when I talked to him last night, he brought this up, and he says that he does this very often. And he found that looking and describing the images to his daughter was the way to keep her engaged in reading, because he, when he would start reading the words of the story, she wouldn't be too interested. And then I asked him this question. I asked him, did the words of the story match up with the, the drawings, the images? And he said, no, they didn't. And what his daughter was interested in is was, was looking at the drawings and seeing and hearing them described. And when he mentioned this, a memory of mine came up 
uh, of an experience I had with my niece Quinn, where she's a little bit older, two and a half maybe, where she read to me a bedtime story, a story about Ariel, Little Mermaid. Oh, and I can show you this now. Um, let me go through here. Story of Ariel, Little Mermaid. And what I saw was, that, of course, the words were much too complicated for her to read, but her reading was looking at these images and describing them. Now, I, I got a little bit of a video of this, and I want to show it to you. And um, I want you to notice a couple of things in the video that I'm going to show to you. I'm going to how, show you how she really focuses on the drawings and also is very dramatic as she describes the story. So I'm going to turn off my video for just a moment. And you'll be able to hear me. And I'm going to turn on a media player. And what I like for you to do is when I, once I start playing the video, I want to get a sense. If you can see it, just say just say yes or raise your hand um, so that I know that you can see it. And I'm going to start playing it right now. Hints for Ariel. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And what did he do? He. He swam, and then he splashed him into the water, and he couldn't even swim. He couldn't swim. So what happened? Ariel, look, Ariel picked pick him up hard as she can, and then... And then what did she do? The sea witch! No! What happened with the sea witch? The sewage want to give her legs, and then she couldn't. She um. The, her dad said, "Get away from that human. They're dangerous." <clears throat> For the sewage of the the sewage. Okay, and I could go on next. forever and ever with this. There's, then, there's so much adorableness and, and cuteness to that. But I just want to give you a quick taste of this because it's going to be um, – and why I think art appreciation is, is, is vital. And um, Linda, absolutely. Some of it is based on her memory. Yep. Definitely. Definitely. So, now I'm not an expert in child development, but it seems to me from my experience with children and just anecdotally that there is a strong desire at an early age not just to look at the world but to describe the world, to use the words that they're learning to understand the world, to see the world not just with their eyes but with their mind. And this is something that at some point in education is lost. And it was lost for me. So I'm coming at this from the perspective of somebody who studied art history but was never satisfied with my experiences with art because I always felt there was something lacking. Every time I glanced at an artwork, I would be immediately visually impressed. Maybe I described the style of it. Oh, that looks like a little bit of Rococo. I can see the, the, the soft colors and the uh, curvy lines. And then I'd run to an art history textbook. Never did I realize that there was something else to do with an artwork to gain the full experience. And that something else is something that I think children do naturally. And it is a skill that is not often taught. And it's a skill that I call reading an artwork. Now, I'm going to very quickly go through what I mean by reading an artwork and a few of the ways that what my little niece Quinn is doing can be made more sophisticated. 
So I described it as not just describing images or putting words to them, but also putting your mind to the description, a purposeful mind looking to figure out a story. And then once I, I'm going to briefly go through these, so if you don't get all this, don't worry about it. But I'm going to give you a couple of examples about how I put this into practice with younger students. So very quickly, reading an artwork. I like to describe it as seeing with words. Whatever you're looking at, you're putting words to it. And this is a kind of liberating experience for kids where they get to put whatever words they want down in their descriptions. Whatever they're seeing, it's theirs, their words. And it's a kind of rewriting exercise. You look at the artwork, you describe it, you go wherever the artwork, you wherever you're being taken to, you're drawing whatever conclusions, you're the author of the novel of this artwork. And then you include also your imagination into this. Because this is not just a diagram of, uh, 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 of a printer, it's a reality and meant to be looked at as a reality. You can do things to immerse yourself and to be imaginative as you get into this reality. Imagine what the characters are saying. Imagine what it feels like in the setting, what you might hear what you um, might smell. Imagine movement, because there is implied movement in the visual arts, in a depiction. And then there's this, which is the key to using your mind to be more sophisticated at grasping what's going on, seeing the purpose behind the detail, the intention of the details. I call it shuttling. I call it shuttling. I, I, it's a term that I've heard before but I really like this term, where you notice details and you infer from them, you ask the question in the back of your mind, what is the possible meaning of this? Like you might be Sherlock Holmes at a crime scene looking for clues. And then the reverse as well. So if you have a conclusion, what are the details that support it? And this is very analytical, deductive. So this person looks happy. What details do you see that suggest that? All right, Deb, thank you very much for stopping by. And if you want to watch, there will be a recording of the, the rest of it. So if you want to catch that, you're much more than welcome to. And then finally, one more important part, making connections. Making connections, making associations, integrating with the rest of your knowledge. Do these characters remind you of characters from literature, from history, from movies that you know. And then more importantly, personal connections. When have you been in a moment like these characters are? And, all right, so that's very quick. And these are all skills that are developed. And I'm going to give you an artwork here that I like to teach to elementary students, often lower elementary, so second, third, and fourth grade. And as you're looking at this, you can start describing for yourself. Now, if we had more time, what I would do here is give you a mini art appreciation lesson where I'd have you start doing a reading and go through the process. But just take a quick look, see what's going on. You can see it looks like a man has come from a long way and everybody's there to greet him. It looks like he's got presents under his arm. And a kid with a hat looks up proudly. And it's not his hat. It looks like it's his dad's hat. Maybe it's his dad. But he, he's holding it for him, and everybody has a big smile on their face. So what I have in front of you now are the worksheets that I, um, that I did with students for this artwork. And I've got two of them to give you an indication of the similarity and the differences between um, the voices that the kids have, the opportunity to be self-expressive, but also of sharing the same story. And a couple of key things I want for you to look at. Can you guys see that OK? It's, I, it might be a little bit fuzzy. Can you make it out OK? All right. So I'll just go through a couple of them. 
first off, down at the bottom, here's a quote. Imagine if you were there, what would they be saying? Uh, and I put it with a, with that young woman who's hugging. I'm so glad you're back. I thought you, uh, you'd be gone longer. And over here, I miss you so much. And then at the top here, what I've got is a question for a personal connection. Who is someone you were looking forward to seeing over the holiday? I looked forward to seeing my cousin Christopher. I was looking forward to seeing my grandma and making these kind of personal connections. And then one more for this shuttling idea. Is the man coming or going, and what are the clues? And of course, it looks like he's coming, but the important part is, what do you see that makes you say that? And I like these. People are smiling. He's facing them. He brought presents. And over here, the kid took his hat. Everyone is happy. There's a woman hugging him. Oh, and then just as a quick title, I like this. Uh, what's your title for the artwork? A Very Happy Family. And what's the title over here? The Hugging Casino. Okay, so just very briefly, I want to show that to you. All right, and I see a hand up. And Linda, um, let's see. I don't know if you put it in the chat, but go ahead and put your uh, query your thought in the chat, and I'll look out for it. Now, next, here's one more example of uh, – uh, no problem, Linda. Here's one more quick example of um, the – the, uh, the practice of the techniques. So we looked at two portraits, stern versus kind, and identified this abstraction. Somebody who's stern, somebody who's kind, have some quotes again, and then what makes them look stern and what makes them look kind. And you can kind of get an idea there of the contrast. Um, and Chris, I think you mentioned early on one of the values is observation and observation, paying attention to details and the significance of details is definitely something that is a value that you can get from uh, reading artworks. But what happens here is the kind of practice you do into, in, in this shuttling becomes automatized, becomes automatic, so that whatever artwork you then come to, and then also whatever real-life situation you come to, your mind starts to automatically think like this. Okay, I'm going to move on now because we don't have much time. I wish we had a lot more time. So, uh, if we had more time, I could show you examples of older students reading this. So, by the end of it, what it is is you just get a piece of paper. You just go ahead and read it. And all these techniques are adapted and they're reflected in their looking, they're seeing with their mind. So what is the value of reading artwork? And a lot of this comes from my uh, my chats with former students. And this is one that I found very interesting. One of my students said it, it helped them find their own voice. And as a um, another student kind of, I think his associate said, it, they felt like they had the freedom to make connections. That when they were looking at this artwork, that there was something personal about it in the reading of the artwork and in the associations they were making. That artwork, as my student put it, that artwork can remind me of my grandmother. And it doesn't remind anybody else of their grandmothers, but it reminds me, and that's valid and that's important. And then what I would have students do is read their readings and make their associations as we're in a group. And what they get to hear is they get to hear others views of that artwork and share their own. And I think that helped them, I think, find your own voice, having an idea of their personal identity and expressing their personal identity and, and seeing how it's different and similar to others and getting ideas from others, I think is very valuable. And then, and doing readings of an artwork as a class is, um, is something that works very well with that. When you're reading a novel, you, you read and understand the novel first, and then you can have discussions afterward. But the process of reading an artwork is your own voice, and that is something that you can express. With a novel, 
the process of making it your own is your imagination, what you see. But that's not something that you can express very easily to others. I see my own image of what Atticus Finch looks like that is not what the movie has, but it's hard for me to express that because of it's in an image in my mind. But your, your experience of the artwork can be expressed. And I think that's the root of where you find your own voice and you have that freedom to make connections. Next up, and this is a phrase that I got from um, a former colleague who's a science teacher I spoke to, who, who trained with me to be an art appreciation teacher and taught art appreciation, loved teaching art appreciation. And he saw art appreciation as a microcosm of, the scienti of scientific observation. So you have an artwork which is self-contained where everything is purposeful, and it's your job to observe and to pick out and to ask the questions to come up with an abstract meaning, which is essentially the same thing that you do when you are looking out at nature. But he said that that's, as a science teacher, that that was more challenging to do because there's a lot of setup in order to show certain laws of nature, or it took a lot of time. So if you're going to uh, observe the phases of the moon, and record those and see the repetition, then that can be very challenging because you've got to do it over time. But in the span of 20, 30 minutes with an artwork, you get to do that. So it's a microcosm of that approach. Now, the combination of these two is something that I think is, is fascinating. There isn't this dichotomy between left brain and right brain in the process of reading an artwork. It integrates the two, and they're both essential for the kind of experience that you want to have that's meaningful, that's powerful with an artwork. So here's my final statement. Reading is a process that involves both observation analysis logic as well as imagination and associations to create a powerful emotional experience with the artwork. So, if I were to go back and say, what's the value of art appreciation in a child's education? It is, it gives them the opportunity to practice this, these skills um, that are assertive in understanding and enjoying great art. Um, now, the final thing I'm going to leave you with is I asked this, these former students who are in college now, what artworks are memorable? And I'm going to harken back to the original importance of art, which is to kind of give you a vision of what's possible in life and uh, to inspire you and to set you in a direction that you want to go. And I'm going to share with you the top three. And these were artworks that they all mentioned. Um, and they, each of them mentioned them um, as, their, as their favorites, as ones that they vividly remember. And you may or may not know them, and I'm not going to get into them, but just to give you a taste of the kind. And this, these are from junior high classes. So I'm not going to give too much away, but I'll get a sense of, do you guys recognize this one? It's a story of a man standing by his conviction even when there is pressure from his friends. And I, I don't like to give the titles of artworks because if you haven't read this art before, often the title is like reading the last page of the book and of a novel and you give it away. Then this was another um, favorite. I, mean, I was kind of surprised, but it was. It really resonated with them, and they really remembered it, about self-possession and having your own identity in spite of uh, flattery. Uh, so I think self-possession is the main idea there. Uh, how, have you guys seen this one before? Maybe this one's less familiar. And then... One more, and this is this is the one that seemed to be most acclaimed. Uh, Jerome, Jean-Léon Jerome. And if you guys are interested, um, I'll stick around and I'll, you guys 
uh, can, or if you can just want to do a screenshot right now and do a Google image search, uh, you can find a, a better image of this. And then there is um, this artwork. Tragic, but I think through the tragedy shows the importance, the grandeur of the choices that you make in your life, whether in romantic love or in dedication to your convictions. And I, this is one that's featured in, in my book, Touching the Art. So uh, I'm not going to give away the title because the title kind of gives away, but I'll give you the artist's name, John Everett Millay. John Everett Millay. And uh, if not, I'll give you some more later on. So this is what they took away. They had this uh, image in their head, like they have a poem in their pocket, image in their head. And it, they would not have found these artworks so meaningful if they did not know how to read them. And, go, and, and as part of the reading process, have them sink in and see the deep personal connections that these moments and these students can have. Okay. Um, I want to pause very quickly right here because it's 9.49 and I promise a 45 minute presentation. Now we did get started a few minutes late, but if you need to leave, I want to say thank you very much for joining me. I'm going to give a few tips uh, in just a moment on what you can do. But if you, I'll be posting some more stuff um, uh, on how to follow up on the uh, Facebook event page. But thank you for joining me if you have to leave. But if you have a few more minutes, stick around. So final image for the presentation, I've got these two. Quinn showing me and reading to me the picture book. And then junior high students would put together their own art appreciation presentation to share with everybody else. And throughout their education, this was first through eighth, but I think it goes beyond that to adulthood. You're seeing the world and observing it with your mind and valuing it becomes more and more sophisticated and is a skill that should be developed because art in the broad sense is very important to life. Now, how can you do, if you're interested, if you're intrigued, if you'd like to do this with the children in your life, how can you do that, make that easier? I've got a few tips. I've got a few tips for you. First of all, there are some basic questions that ease reading. Now notice I've not focused on abstract art. Because abstract art, the way that you get into abstract art, you don't have a story that's universally viewable by everybody and understandable by everybody. You can talk about it in terms of style, and you can talk about it in, um, in terms of the artist's intent or your subjective responses. But there is no story that everybody can kind of agree on. Um, so that's, that's something separate from reading an artwork that I'm talking about here. So when you're reading an artwork that projects a story that is graspable, here are some basic questions. What's happening? There is something going on. It's a moment in a story. There are characters. So what kind of people are they? And then part of the shuttling process. Oh, you notice the detail? Why is that there? It's a small book. Why do you think it's a small book? What kind of book could it be? Or if you come to a broader conclusion, what are the details that support that? Oh, this woman over here looks very sad. What makes you say that she looks very sad? What do you see? So they're shelling back and forth. So these are some basic questions. And you can get more refined. And when I teach a class, I always start off, or teach an artwork, I always start off with these basic questions and go from there. 
But if you want to copy anything down or you want to take a screenshot of anything to help you with reading an artwork, I'd take that right there. Next up. So finding uh, what I'll call readable art. Um, art that projects stories that can be identifiable. Um, things to make it easier. Find art with background stories already. And oftentimes, like myths. Uh, if there is a background story, then there is a moment depicted from that story. You can kind of try to piece it together. In a good artwork, you don't need the background story. So I never, never, if I'm introduced to artwork, never start with a background story. Start with the artwork itself and come up with a story. And then you can go to the background story and see if it fits. And sometimes the background story doesn't quite fit with what you've, you've seen. And you know what happens then? You gain the certainty about what you see and you, you, the artist is wrong in those cases. And that's happened to me and, and happened in class before. But what you develop when reading artwork is this kind of confidence of your observations and your integrations and your conclusions. But then it's really fun to have the background story match up with what you're doing. And I'll give you one website that I go to a lot called artmagic.com, um, which features hundreds of artworks based on myths and legends throughout the centuries, a great resource. Now, if you have younger children, I would recommend Norman Rockwell. Norman Rockwell is a wonderful artist. The, the painting of the, uh, the homecoming, the, the HUD casino, that's Norman Rockwell painting, often depicts children. And Norman Rockwell is brilliant at picking out moments from a child's life that are um, interesting and that are very relatable to children. And then one more resource that I'll give you here is a site called IamAChild.wordpress.com. It's a blog. It's been going on for years, and I've been using it for years, which just posts artworks throughout, from throughout history featuring children. So that is a great resource uh, to go to. And then as far as viewing an artwork, yeah, it's, it's not convenient if you just pull up your, your iPhone and look at an artwork there. What you want to do is you want to make an experience. And when I'm at an art museum, we find an artwork that we want and we sit down. I wish there were cushioned couches at art museums in front of every artwork, like a movie theater. And then you can settle in and take in and have the immersive experience of reading it together. Now, if you're doing it at home, um, I'd say find a huge screen. If you have the, oh, if you have like a, if you, a TV screen that you can put images on, that's great. Or I also like using a tablet. And with a tablet, you can zoom in easily, uh, which is very helpful to focus your attention on one part of the painting and just describe that and then go back out and see how it fits the whole. And find high resolution images. And I, you guys are all internet savvy, but what I do is I just go on, on Google images and click the search tool that's for size and click large and find the painting, the same painting that comes up over and over again, but in a large size and get that one. And then one more thing. Oh, I've got a gift for you. I forgot to mention that at the beginning. I've got a gift for you. Um, and the gift that I've got for you is a, um, or some scripts for reading a lot of artworks. And this is from a self-guided tour um, that I put together for the LA County Museum of Art. And there are artworks that you can find online easily uh, with uh, several questions to help you get engaged, with background information about the story, um, and with associations and connections and a theme that you might be able to connect with. And it includes these two paintings. Uh, the two girls reading and this tragic moment. So there, there's a wide range of paintings. And to get that, uh, let me give you the site. You're going to go to 
this site right here, and I'm going to post it in the chat. You can copy and paste this. I don't think you can click on it, but you can copy and paste it and go there immediately, and you can download that right here right now. So download that. Um, go ahead, do it. You'll have it on hand, and if you want to engage and make use of any of those, it's there for you. Now, if you get there, um, yeah, absolutely. Please do share this. Please do share this. If you're there and you are interested in a couple of things, and this is if you want more, then um, first off, if you haven't read my book, that's it's very simple, very approachable, it's short. And it's like going on an art tour with me. That's how I tried to write it. Uh, so Touching Art, the book, is I'd recommend that. And you can get that right now if you like. Uh, it's uh, as an ebook, as a PDF file. Now, next thing. I'd like to start teaching art appreciation classes for children. I've done so with adults. And I've done so many years in a live classroom, but I haven't done so online yet. So I want to start teaching art appreciation classes for children online. And if you are interested in an online art appreciation course, I'm imagining um, once a week, 30, 40 minutes during a day, maybe Thursdays, and different classes, so I would have maybe one a lower elementary, like a second, third grade, then an upper elementary, maybe like fourth, fifth, sixth, and then maybe a junior high high where it becomes more sophisticated. And so please indicate to me on when you go to this page for the free download, please indicate to me right here, I've got a couple of questions. Which TTA courses are you interested in? And uh, if you want to sign up for any of the mailing lists, uh, the literature at our house, which is my um, uh, literature classes, as well as uh, Touching the Art, where you get information about the tours I give and so forth. So please give me a heads up there. And then uh, finally, if you're really inclined not just to engage in art with your children, but also to want to learn something that you maybe feel like you were never taught, like I did, starting next week, I've got a Touching the Art 201 class, so an art appreciation for adults class, where you'll become proficient at reading artwork. And I've got a couple of veterans in here from... Uh, last year's Touching the Art 201 class, but it's a 10-week course designed to make those skills a habit. And there are still spaces, and um, there's a link to that when you go to the uh, download page. Okay. Thank you very much for joining me. If you have questions or thoughts, um, I'll take them now. If you want me to go back to any part of the presentation, any of the artworks, I'll do that now. If you've got to go, thank you for sticking around for an hour. Um, there will be a recording of this presentation available in a few hours, and I'm going to post the link on the Facebook event page. Feel free to share that recording with anybody you like. All right, and I'm going to uh, – you're going to see the, a lot of my forehead because I'm going to be looking at the uh, – at the chat for a few moments. If you have a question that you want to address, raise your hand so because my chat scrolls by pretty quickly. And I'm reading some of this. All right. Yeah, tool see you in TTA two oh one. Uh, so, Linda, you're asking if it's an accredited – no, it's not an accredited course. No. But if uh, if there's anything that I can help 
uh, any kind of recommendation or anything like that. Uh, are you? Uh, I want to make sure what, to know what you're talking about. You're talking about TPA 201, because I make it sound like a college course. Yeah. yeah. So, or. Yeah, so, no, it's not an accredited course. Maybe one day. So, Linda, yeah, I'm curious, what did you think? Um, you uh, Does this feel like it's something that's... Uh, that you do in your classes or that you would like to do? Uh, and I'll get to you in a moment, Linda. So, Kara, I see, do, how often do I offer TK201? So, after it last fall, I'm offering it this fall. Um, enrollment hasn't been as brisk as I've wanted for this fall, but I'm going to keep, as I'm hoping to build up more interest, and I want to offer it again in the spring. I think. It's the most valuable class that I can offer, more than the book, more than the kids' classes, I think. Because adults, when they come on one of my tours or they see a presentation of mine they, and they experience reading the artwork, they say, wow, that was amazing. But then they, they don't really know how to do it themselves. And it's, it's important, if you want to get, if you want for the rest of your life to approach art and to get the kind of joy and meaning that you get from an artwork that you do from a novel, it's important to have the approach automatized. So I would like to give it in the spring. And if there's enough, uh, if there are enough people who want to take it in the spring, uh, then I'll definitely be giving it. So let's see. Uh, so Stacy, um, I offered it in the fall. I didn't offer it last spring, and I'm offering it in the fall again now. Um, and starting next week, and um, I'm hoping to offer it again in the spring. So it's a 10-week course, 10-week course, once a week meeting. And Anne Marie, I'm looking at what you're saying. Uh, all right, I'm glad you you found those question ideas helpful. Great. And let's see. And Linda, you say you teach childhood, pre-K, kindergarten. Uh huh. Simplify it for the kids. Yep. And Stacy, there will be future classes whenever you or, or Dash are ready. From. Um, bye, bye, Rebecca. Hi, Kieran. All right, any final thoughts or questions? Anybody else before I sign off? My pleasure, Linda. Bye, Anne-Marie. Steve, I'd love to have you. Bye, Stacy. All right, I'm signing off, everybody. Uh, find me, uh, fill out that quick survey, send me your, your thoughts and feelings on what you'd like to see in the future, and keep in touch. Have a good night.